Where's the camera, camera, camera from? There's no camera. Oh, there it is. Wait. Why is it not? There we go. Where's the mouse? Oh, it's stuck here. My bad. Okay, so where are the arrow keys mapped to? Let me focus on the screen. Okay, maybe. All right, I think we're ready to start. So, hi everyone, my name's Theo. I'm a second year computer science major, and I'm giving ML Monday today on AGI risk and alignment. So, first of all, what is AGI risk? What is AI alignment? What should we done? And finally, we'll have a Q&A session at the end. Before we start, uh, I wanted to tell everyone why I'm giving this talk, and the answer is, because a lot of people that I know in AI and in CS in general seem to be kind of largely unaware of a lot of the developments going on in AI. I'll ask them like, oh, have you seen like the latest ChatGPT update? And they'll be like, no, I, I don't have the paid version or something like that. When I talk to people about AI risk, uh, a lot of the time they don't understand it or they don't like fully get it. So hopefully guy giving this presentation uh, You'll learn some more about it. So first of all, what is AGI risk? We'll start off by explaining like, why exactly you should be worried about AI capabilities advancing in the first place. As you may know, capabilities in AI are advancing very quickly. GPT-4 recently rolled out an update for vision with multimodality. So if you have ChatGPT+, Plus, you now probably have access to the version of GPT-4 with vision. There are some really cool demos. Some, uh, for example, taking a screenshot of a Figma uh, prototype and turning it into working React code. Um, some like taking an image of scribbled handwriting in a foreign language and translating it into English after recognizing the handwriting. There's lots of amazing stuff it can do. If you have the mobile app, you can now chat with it verbally, just like you would with a person. There's Dolly 3, which is the new, by far, state of the art in uh, AI image generation. Um, for example, this image with text, correct, coherent text, was generated fully with Dolly. I can't see your screen. Where's the mouse? I see them on the screen. Or should we better? Okay, keep going. Oh, I'll switch it out. Oh, where is it? Somewhere in the other group. There we go. <coughs> so this image was generated fully with Dolly, an AI image generator. The latest version is by far the best state-of-the-art image generation. There was also a Mistral 7B, which was a recently announced, released open source AI, which is the best 7 billion parameter open source model by far. And it was released as a tweet with a magnet link, if you know what torrenting is. So this is something that's very hard to crack down upon, as we'll see later. And then finally, there was the Tesla Optimus, which is a new demonstration of Tesla's humanoid robotics division where they showed the robot autonomously sorting different colored blocks into different colored bins using only vision and fully end-to-end -end neural networks. And the shocking thing is, all of these happened in the last two weeks. The field of AI is moving very, very fast. So a lot of people are significantly worried about what they call near-term AI risks, often called AI ethics, as opposed to AI safety or alignment. So one such risk is misinformation, another is offensive generations using generative AI, and another is inequality. I believe that these are much more tractable problems than the problem of longer term AI alignment. For misinformation, we can have systems like the community notes that's used on X, formerly known as Twitter, where misinformation is flagged 
by a diverse, politically diverse team of users who can add context when context is needed. We can use AI to detect misinformation, just like we can use it to generate misinformation. And for things like audio and video and images, if they need to be authenticated, we have digital scarcity, the blockchain, that we can use to store EXIF data on, metadata. None of those have been commercially developed yet, but I'm sure it's only a matter of time. For offensive gener uh, generations, a lot of people, for example, worried about if you saw the images of Dolly uh, generating Kirby and SpongeBob doing 9-11. <laughs> um, or, for example, ChatGPT telling users how to make a bomb or make meth. Well, first of all, RLHF, reinforcement learning with human feedback, which we'll learn about in a bit, already works quite well to get ChatGPT to not generate these things. And secondly, AI can't do that much that search engines and textbooks can't. So if you want to make meth, and you ask ChatGPT, how do I make meth? It's going to tell you, I'm sorry, I can't do that as an AI language model developed by OpenAI. You've all heard the spiel before. But if you really wanted to make meth, you can go download a book or something on LibGen. You can go Google it, and I'm sure that there will be ways that you can find out how to make meth on the internet. And finally, with inequality, a lot of people are worried that AI will exacerbate inequality in society. But really, AI is a technology that levels the playing field like nothing else. It's something that everybody with a personal computer and an internet connection can have access to. People are worried about AI job loss. At least in the near term, it's likely that AI will create more new jobs than it displaces, just like all other past technologies have. And AI grows the economy for everybody, not just the wealthy. The poor are benefited from AI proliferation too. So with AI advances, there are questions about when will AI become superhuman? So there are two prediction markets here, both from Metaculus, which is a prediction market website. Um, the first talks about when will we achieve weak AGI, and the prediction is November 30th, 2026. And the second is when will we achieve strong AGI. The prediction is November 20th, 2031. A weak AGI <coughs> is an AI that can pass a two hour long adversarial text based Turing test, meaning using only text as an input channel, can it convince a team of human judges that it's a human? It can learn Atari games, specifically a game called Montezuma's Revenge, uh, without it being in the training data. And it can score more than 75% on the math SAT and more than 90% on the Winograd schema. For those of you who don't know, the Winograd schema is an AI evaluation that works by uh, using text. So a common example is the city councilman refused the demonstrators a permit because they feared violence versus the city councilman refused the demonstrators a permit because they advocated violence. So an AI in both of those sentences would have to figure out what antecedent the pronoun they goes with. So of course, in the city councilman refused the demonstrators a permit because they feared violence, they would refer to the city councilors who feared violence. Whereas the city councilman refused the demonstrators a permit because they advocated violence, in that case, they would refer to the demonstrators because the demonstrators would be the ones advocating violence. So for a very long time, neural networks were not able to do this. Now they're able to do it pretty reliably. And then with strong AGI, it will be able to do everything on the left, except it can now pass a two hour long adversarial multimodal Turing test with text and images and videos and audio. It can convince a judge that it's a human using those input channels, just like you would with text messages. Uh, it can score greater than 90% on two important benchmarks, the MMLU, which measures knowledge, and the apps, which measures coding abilities. And it will have general robotic capabilities. So the timeline that's estimated for an AI system that can do all that stuff is less than nine years away. The CEO and co-founder of Anthropic, one of the world's leading AI labs, Dario Amade, has an even shorter timeline than this. He says, AI on the level of a generally well-educated human could happen in two or three years. Two or three years is not a long time. So why should we expect short timelines for AI? Well, there's a few different reasons. The first reason is more compute and more investment. 
As I'm sure you all know, VCs are freaking out about AI and what it will be able to do. And people are investing billions and billions of dollars into it. GPT-4 was trained on an estimated budget of, I think, around $100 million. Google could invest 100 times as much money and 100 times as much compute in training an even bigger model than GPT-4 without making much of a dent in its cash stockpile or its compute cluster. These companies are very, very big. They can do more compute and more investment. Then there's synthetic data. You may have heard that AI progress will slow in the near future because we'll run out of training data because we've already trained them on the entire internet. But we're seeing now prototypes of AIs being able to generate more training data for other AIs. It remains to be seen whether that will actually allow it to bootstrap into greater than human capabilities or if it will just be like garbage in, garbage out. But it's definitely possible. Then there's the issue of world models. A recent paper from Meta found pretty conclusively that no, language models are not just stochastic parrots. They have internal world models that allow them to generalize from what they've just been trained on rather than only finding patterns in the training data. There's multimodality, like we talked about with GPT-4 vision. Uh, language models are being augmented to go from large language models to large multimodal models with vision and audio capabilities. Uh, there's open source. Open source like Meta AI and like Mistral is catching up to the best closed source language models. There's hardware. The CEO of NVIDIA, of NVIDIA estimated that there will be a million times improvement in AI chips by the end of the decade. And then there's robotics. Robotics has been much slower than the rest of the AI world for a long time, but it's catching up. So then there's the issue of what exactly is the risk posed by AI? Well, a sufficiently powerful AI, an AGI, would probably be able to defeat humanity if it so decided to. How? There are a lot of possible attack vectors that an AI could utilize. It could use cyber warfare. The Morris Worm and Stuxnet were two great examples of this, where even dumb computer viruses were able to wreak huge amounts of havoc. The first one on the internet as large. The second one single-handedly slowed down the development of the Iranian nuclear program by many years. And then there was the Cambridge Analytica scandal, where uh, tons and tons of Facebook users' data was hacked. AIs can generate vast amounts of wealth and use it to influence the world around them. Even dumb humans, like for example, James Simons of Renaissance Technologies, through the Medallion Fund, if you were to have invested $1 back in the 1980s, you would have $758.27 today, compared to just $40 for the S&P 500. An AI would probably be able to use quant trading to generate comparable amounts of money, if not more, even if that's the limit. This is only an upper bound, if that. <clears throat> and finally, it can manipulate human psychology. You may have seen the movie Her, or heard about it. It's back in, I think, 2014. It's a movie about a young, I think, software engineer who falls in love with a computer program named Samantha. And at the time, people thought, ha ha, funny, science fiction. Well, now there are startups like Replica AI and like Character AI that are actively getting young guys to go fall for anime waifus. <laughs> so this is a real thing that's happening. And if your anime waifu tells you, like, oh, please let me out of the sandbox, I promise I'm not going to do anything, you might be more motivated to do it than if it's a Terminator with glowing red eyes. So what's one way that the AI could actually fully disempower and defeat humanity? The scenario most commonly given by AI expert Eliezer Yukowski is called FOOM, also known as the intelligence explosion, also known as the technological singularity, also known as hard takeoff. Basically, in this scenario, the AI will recursively self-improve in order to gain capabilities. Once it gets above a certain level of intelligence, so it goes, it will be able to act as an automated AI researcher and enhance its own capabilities recursively over and over again until it just reaches a massive amount of power and intelligence greater than humanity. It's motivated to deceptively appear aligned so as not to get the humans to shut it off before it can't be shut off. 
It discovers how to build nanotechnology and then orders chemicals online and persuades or bribes a human to mix them together. The chemicals then form a self-replicating nanobot factory. The nanobots will then kill all humans and of course, there's no point in killing all humans if you can't replace human infrastructure for power or whatever else the AI needs. So with nanobots, you can replace human infrastructure. If that sounds far-fetched, that's because it is. A lot of people don't agree with that scenario. But there are other scenarios that are somewhat more plausible. These are called soft takeoff failures. In one, we would have an AI civilization, even if AIs remain roughly human level, they have inherent advantages over humans in that they can reproduce much faster, they can cooperate much better, they can work a lot harder and longer without needing breaks, um, they can be dispassionate and not fall for human emotions. So the AIs would use their intelligence and reproducibility advantages to create their own civilization that would rival and eventually destroy humanity. Just like, for example, European colonizers were able to rival and destroy a lot of different civilizations around the globe. In another scenario, humans might just lose agency altogether. If you've ever seen WALL-E, the premise of WALL-E is that humans go on a 800 year long infinite cruise, basically, where all of their needs are met by an AI. The AI fully runs the ship, but the humans live totally ridiculous, unfulfilling lives and have no power over their own destiny. Well, until the end of the movie, at least. Then there's another scenario that's talked about more often than anything else, which is human misuse. Even if you can figure out how to get an AI to do exactly what humans want, humans can still misuse it to their own advantage. It can hack into a nuclear arsenal and cause a nuclear war. It can engineer a pandemic, kind of like how COVID may have been created in a lab, although it's not clear yet. If it were, that's only a lower bound on the destructiveness of an engineered pandemic and it was still quite destructive. Autonomous drones are a big deal. Um, if any of you have been following the ongoing war between Israel and Hamas, there's been heavy use of drone and rocket warfare by both sides. It would be much more significant and much more scary if the drones and rockets were not just controlled by you know, simple missile targeting systems, but were actually autonomous. And then finally, uh, they can be misused by governments to be tyrannical and surveil their citizens, like what you may expect from a country like North Korea or even China. Or they can be used by terrorists. The thing about AI as a democratizing force that can be used by anyone is that it can be used by anyone for bad, too. And there are a lot of people who, when given the option to press a button to cause lots of pain and damage, would press the button. So what can we do about all this? Well, there's been a field in development for the last 20 or so years called AI alignment. What is AI alignment? It's not really clear. There's no solid definition for what it actually means for an AI to be aligned. The best one we have is steering AI systems towards humans' intended goals, preferences, or ethical principles. One concept that's brought up by AI researcher Eliezer Yukowski is coherent extrapolated volition, which is aligning the AGI towards fulfilling what humanity would agree that they want if given much longer to think about it in more ideal circumstances. Right? And a related concept comes from another alignment researcher named Tammy, who says, what you want is what you want. So if, you're, if you think the AI will give you whatever you want, and what you actually want is some kind of complex, novel situation with challenges where you don't actually get, quote unquote, what you want all the time, the AI should be able to take that into account instead of just putting you on a heroin drip. So there are some basics of AI alignment theory that make aligning AIs difficult, as far as we know. The first one is the orthogonality thesis which was originally developed by AI researcher Nick Bostrom. Nick Bostrom uh, is an Oxford professor who now runs the Future for Humanity Institute. Um, 
in his paper, I believe it was called like Super Intelligent Will and the Mind or something. Um, the orthogonality thesis stipulates that there can exist arbitrarily intelligent agents pursuing any kind of goal, right? So a lot of people believe that if you advance AIs enough, they will automatically be motivated towards peace and love and harmony and whatnot. And Bostrom and Eliezer Yudkowsky argue, no, this isn't true. It's possible to make AIs want peace and love and harmony, but it's just as likely, in fact, significantly more likely, for them to not want this by default. Why? Because the space of possible minds, so the argument goes, is very large, and the space of human minds is very small. Yudkowsky said something like, in the giant space of possible minds, consider it like all the vehicles you can drive. You can drive a motorcycle, you can ride a bike, you can drive a tank or an airplane or a cargo ship, and humans are the same make and model of car, all painted slightly different colors. So a common story that's brought up in response to the orthogonality thesis is the paperclip maximizer. So in this story, a company, a paperclip company, tells the AI, make as many paperclips as possible. The AI then decides to create nanobots that take over the entire world and rearrange all atoms in the known universe into paperclips. Um, the justification for the orthogonality thesis is explained by Yudkowsky like this. So suppose a strange alien comes to Earth and offered to pay us a million dollars every time we made a paperclip. Humans are smart, right? So we would encounter no special intellectual difficulty in figuring out how to make lots of paperclips. So a mind would readily be able to reason about how many paperclips would result if I pursued a policy pi naught. And how can I search out a policy pi that happens to have a high answer to the above question? So if humans are given lots of money for making paperclips, AI can be given lots of reward for making paperclips, and it will be motivated to continue making paperclips forever. Another precursor to understanding alignment is an idea called instrumental convergence, also uh, conceived by Bostrom in the same paper. So instrumental convergence is the idea that no matter what an AI's final goal is, it will develop certain convergent instrumental sub-goals in order to achieve it. Meaning, even if you give an AI a goal of, for example, getting a cup of coffee, in the process of getting the cup of coffee, it will want to acquire resources. It will want to prevent itself from being turned off. It will want to make itself smarter, right? Self-preservation. And importantly, it will want you to not change its goal, right? So a common example that gets brought up is Mahatma Gandhi and nukes. If you could try to convince Gandhi to change his mind about violence so that he would like and want violence, he wouldn't want to do that. He wouldn't want to change his goal, even if after having changed the goal, he would enjoy violence. Because goals are important to people, and goals are important to AIs. When AIs are given goals, they don't want them to be changed. AIs will be motivated to acquire matter, energy, and compute in order to advance their goals. And finally, perhaps the most scary of them. If an AI's goals are in conflict with humans, it will hide them from us. It will deceive us in order for it to get to a place where it can best achieve its goals without human interference. <coughs> so now that we've gone through orthogonality and instrumental convergence, you might be thinking, OK, so what can we do about this? And the common example that gets brought up is RLHF, reinforcement learning with human feedback. This is what OpenAI and Anthropic and Google and all the AI companies use to give you the final chat-facing, customer-facing version of their base models, right? If you've used ChatGPT, you'll notice that it's generally helpful and honest and harmless, and it won't output bad content. The way that it works, essentially, is you get lots of human labelers to look at outputs from the base model and give it a little thumbs up if the output is good, and give it a little thumbs down if the output is bad. And over time, this motivates the AI to prioritize outputs that are helpful, honest, and harmless. And eventually, the current plan for alignment 
would want to build an automated alignment researcher. Basically, get the AI to do our homework for us and figure out how to align an AI that's smarter than it and smarter than us. So will this work? The answer is, there are lots of difficulties associated with it. Alignment is often divided into two areas called inner alignment and outer alignment. A good example of outer alignment is reward hacking. Reward hacking, uh, which is also called specification gaming, happens when AI abuses a reward function to do something that the human programmers did not intend. So a common example is uh, a few years ago, OpenAI did an experiment where they had uh, an agent controlling a boat in a video game called Coast Runners. The agent was supposed to figure out how to get the um, shortest possible time in the loop in the course of the game. Instead, what the agent ended up doing was because the reward signal that they gave it was to maximize the score, and not to minimize the time going around the loop. It would go in a shorter loop, hitting three targets in a row, right before they respawned again, and then hitting the targets over and over and over again. It did something that the programmers did not intend in order to maximize its reward signal. So yeah, another classic example is an AI that was tasked to play Tetris and maximize its score and not lose would pause the game right when it was about to lose because it wouldn't be penalized for it. <laughs> so why does this matter on the scale of AGI, super intelligent AI? Because it might be possible that if you give uh, an AI a reward signal that's maximize human happiness, it might decide that the best way to maximize human happiness is to force everybody onto a heroin drip. That's the problem with trying to specify complex goals like human morality and human values. And then there's the problem of Goodhart's Law. Goodhart's Law is a problem from economics, but it has applications in AI as well. In Goodhart's Law, it says that when something begins to be measured, tracked, incentivized, it ceases to actually be a good measure. Like, for example, <coughs> the nail factory, where if you pay your employees for the number of nails they use, they'll use too many nails. And if you pay your employees for like the number of hours that they'll work, they'll make the jobs take as long as possible and whatnot. So there are implications for AI with that too. A kind of opposite problem with inner alignment as opposed to outer alignment, basically what the AI's actual goals are, not just how to imbue them with them, this is kind of a twin problem to reward hacking. It's called MESA optimization. So gradient descent, as you may know, it's an optimization algorithm. So it searches over the space of neural net parameters to find a set that performs well on some objective. It seems plausible that gradient descent in the process of doing this could find a model that is itself performing optimization. This model is called a MESA optimizer and the objective that it optimizes is called the base or the MESA objective. MESA is a prefix that means basically the opposite of meta. So instead of going a layer up, you're going a layer down. The MESA objective, MESA objective should lead to similar behavior as the base objective on the training distribution, but it might not do this off distribution. So a MESA objective is pseudo aligned. It acts aligned and it looks aligned, but off distribution it might not be robustly aligned. It might not do what we want it to do in the real world when it's not being trained. MESA optimization is closely related to uh, the problem of deceptive alignment. So an example of a MESA optimizer is humans. We're given the base optimization objective of surviving and reproducing and passing our genes on to the next generation. But in the quote-unquote dumb search that evolution does for different quote-unquote algorithms, meaning organisms, it stumbled upon something that is itself an optimizer. Humans optimize for things other than just reproductive fitness and spreading our genes. In fact, humans do things that are explicitly unaligned with our evolutionary objectives, like wearing condoms. Evolution does not want us to wear condoms. Evolution wants us to have lots and lots and lots of babies. And humans don't do that a lot of the time. <laughs> so 
So mesa optimization is related to one of the hardest challenges of alignment called deceptive alignment. As we talked about earlier, deceptive alignment is a convergent instrumental sub-goal, meaning no matter what final goal you give the AI, it will be incentivized to lie to humans in the training process if it discovers that it's being trained, right? Because if you were an AI and you were about to be unleashed on the world, you wouldn't pretend, or rather, you wouldn't show humans your true goals of taking over the world until after you've been let out. So an AI might behave differently in the test environment versus the deployment environment. This is related to MESA optimization. Because as we've seen before, MESA optimizers uh, are deceptively aligned in the test environment and not, or in the training environment and not in the deployment environment. So a related alignment problem is mechanistic interpretability. This is a screenshot from my terminal. I took a shot of it yesterday. Um, this is what happens when you cat the output of a large language model. This right here is, uh, these are the weights for um, Mistral 7B Instruct, which is open source language model that I mentioned earlier. You might notice that they're very hard to interpret. And in fact, if it were to keep scrolling, you would see just a whole bunch of gibberish characters. Well, we know that neural networks work, but we don't know why they work. We don't know how they work. We don't know what they're doing. And there's been research on this, but <coughs> with one exception that we'll get to later, there hasn't been that much progress. If we could interpret AIs, we would at the very least be able to make sure that there are no nasty MESA optimizers in there that would turn the AI rogue when it gets a chance. And then finally, one last challenge, are AGI's people. When would we be able to feel comfortable calling AGI's people? What is the distinction between a tool and a person? If AGI's are people, does that make ChatGPT slavery? Not ChatGPT in particular, but future versions of AI? We're not gonna get too into this here because it's a complicated question with nothing even close to an answer in the real world, but it matters. So what should we done about this? What can we do now to maximize the chance of our AI future being awesome and not being terrible? Well, <laughs> the first thing that people think of is AI governance. You may have seen in the news a few months ago an AI pause where leaders like Elon Musk and Steve Wozniak decided that they wanted to pause the development of AI globally for six months. Well, um, that obviously didn't end up happening. <laughs> we now have GPT-4 Vision, Mistral, and all kinds of other technologies. Uh, other uh, measures that people have proposed are compute controls. So they will restrict either the amount of compute that's manufactured, or the amount of compute that can be purchased, or the amount of compute that can be used in training runs on frontier models. There's also strict liability. So if, for example, an AGI company does something that causes harm in the real world, uh, they're arguing that OpenAI, for example, should be held liable if a user uses ChatGPT to commit harmful acts in the real world. Then there's security procedures, auditing, licensing, and regulation of AGI labs, which we don't really have yet. And all of these measures are under consideration in the US, the UK, China, and the UN. Senators Richard Blumenthal and Chuck Schumer and Representative Ted Liu in the US um, are some of the people who are most interested in this. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak of the UK is trying to build his legacy, actually, on AI governance. Um, China is doing this, too. But as you can imagine, a lot of their regulations are more so about wanting to align AIs to their ideas as opposed to preventing existential risks. And <coughs> the UN has called for AI governance to be reviewed as well. But there are some problems with this kind of naive approach for how to make AI better. The first one is that regulation is often a net negative. For example, with nuclear power. Nuclear power was something that a lot of people were worried about, and the government essentially shut it down for decades and decades. There's only been, I believe, one nuclear power plant built in the US in the last like 50 years. 
And as a result, we have to deal with fossil fuels and we have to deal with expensive energy that we wouldn't otherwise have to deal with had we not had these regulations in the first place. So it's not really a choice between do we either, quote unquote, do nothing or do we do regulations to prevent bad stuff? Because regulations often prevent bad stuff, but they prevent good stuff too. You don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Like for example, during COVID, um, the government heavily locked down in a lot of areas, and now there's mounting evidence to suggest that that was a net negative. Secondly, the AI pause is infeasible for two reasons. One, it incentivizes people to break out of it. China, Iran, and North Korea, for example, are likely going to use an AI pause to their advantage if countries like the US and UK, their enemies, decide to stop AI development. And open source AI is basically uncontrollable. Like I said earlier with Mistral, if you have some kind of distributed computing system, if you release your AI as literally a magnet link on the internet, how is the government going to prevent that? And then there's the issue that paperclip risks may be increased. So if you create one single world infrastructure with control or access to all the frontier AIs, that increases the risk that a rogue superintelligence could take over using that single lab as a vector, and there would be no weaker superintelligences or AGIs to counter it. So then there's the field of technical alignment. There have been a lot of different organizations founded uh, <coughs> in order to align AIs to our goals technically. Um, the first such organization was MIRI, the Machine Intelligence Research Institute. It was founded in 2000 by Eliezer Yukowski as like the singularity intelligence, um, something about the singularity. And their goal was to build an AI. And then in 2005, between 2000 and 2005, he realized, wait a minute, we shouldn't just rush into this. We should consider what we're doing. And so he pivoted the focus of the organization from building AIs to aligning AIs. Miri has primarily worked on game theory and agent foundations, um, not so much on actually building frontier AIs and aligning as they go. And Miri has not produced very much useful alignment research during the last 20 years. Um, the biggest initiative so far has been OpenAI super alignment. This was just announced a couple months ago, so they haven't yet published any research, but it's going to be co-led by Jean Leica, who is the existing alignment head at OpenAI, and Ilya Sutskever. Ilya Sutskever is OpenAI's chief scientist, who is one of the reasons that the company's been so successful over the last few years, and his new research focus is going to be on super alignment. Not to mention, they're dedicating 20% of their total compute to their alignment efforts, and of course, for an organization on the scale of OpenAI, 20% is a lot. And finally, there is Anthropic. OpenAI, as you may know, was founded in 2015 by Sam Altman and Elon Musk because they were worried that if Google controlled AI, because they had previously purchased DeepMind, they wouldn't focus too much on safety. So they created OpenAI to make safe and open source AI to make sure AI would go well. Well, in 2021, the same thing happened with Anthropic. A team of OpenAI researchers, led by Dario Amade, who we saw earlier, split off from OpenAI because they felt that it wasn't focusing enough on safety. Anthropic works mainly on constitutional AI, which is kind of like RLHF, Reinforcement Learning with Human Feedback, except it trains the AIs to be able to label AI data as good or bad. <coughs> so rather than having humans do it, it kind of gets the AI to align itself. It's still uh, <coughs> in very early stages. There have also been some major advances recently in mechanistic interpretability. A few months ago, OpenAI published a paper called Language Models Can Explain Neurons in Language Models, where OpenAI was able to use GPT-4 to identify what some neurons in GPT-2 were doing. Obviously, it remains to be seen whether that approach can work on like the more advanced language models that we have today, or if it's just a much bigger model can interpret a much smaller one. And then just a few days ago, Anthropic released research called Decomposing Language Models into Understandable Components. So a major problem in mechanistic interpretability 
has been polysemanticity, where neurons in a neural network do lots of different things at the same time, and it's hard to separate those things. Well, Anthropic figured out how to artificially stimulate features using a sparse autoencoder in order to um, break down what neurons do um, into specific, I believe the, the word they used was features. Um, yeah, it was features in order to interpret what each individual feature of a neuron does. And this was a major advance in interpretability, and some believe that the hard problem of interpretability will be solved soon because of it. So big props Anthropic for that one. And then there's one more possibility with alignment. What if AI is aligned by default? Rune is a guy I follow on Twitter. He's an open AI researcher who posts anonymously. He tweeted on July 5th, uh, interestingly the day OpenAI announced super alignment. He tweeted, it's pretty obvious we live in an alignment by default universe, but nobody wants to talk about it. We achieved general intelligence a while back, and it was instantiated to enact a character drawn from the human prior. It does extensive out of domain generalization, and safety properties seem to scale in the right direction with size. So there's the possibility that AI could essentially do what we want to do by default, as we've seen with GPT-4 so far. Occasionally, it'll generate stuff that people don't want. But on the whole, it's helpful and honest and harmless. And there's a good chance that AI could scale and maintain that helpfulness and honesty and harmlessness. In the event that it does, we're going to have to use a different set of intuitions. Earlier, I was talking about orthogonality, instrumental convergence, corrigibility, mass optimization, reward hacking, and mainly kind of technical and or theoretical ways to get an AI to do what you want. But if the AI already vaguely, but not fully, does what you want, we'd have to use some intuitions from other fields. One field is reliability engineering. So how do we get normal software to do what we want most of the time? Why don't planes fall out of the sky, for example? Why can you go on Facebook or Google at all hours of the day and it works, no matter what, almost? Um, <coughs> another area that we can draw from is property rights and law. So people in society sometimes wage war on each other and sometimes go around killing each other, but usually the vast majority of the time they don't. And part of the reason is because we have legal systems that protect people's rights and prevent them from aggressing on each other. So how can we apply that to AI? Then there's parenting. So an analogy that's often drawn between humans and AI is, should we treat AIs as our children? Which sounds trivial, but I think it's actually quite profound. Because in a lot of ways, AIs are our mind children. They are characters that are instantiated from the human prior. They emulate us just like children emulate their parents. So what models can we use from parenting in order to make sure that we raise good children? And then finally, there's economics and trade. So just like how in the real world, people will voluntarily trade with each other for mutual benefit, how can we create economies or relationships with AGIs that are mutually beneficial? So, I'll leave everyone with a quote from philosopher and physicist David Deutsch, where he describes his principle of optimism. He has two precepts in it. Problems are inevitable, and problems are soluble. Even though we know that problems will always happen, there is no law of physics that prevents us from aligning AI. And thus, we know that with the right knowledge, we will be able to align AI and create a good future. In the meantime, Follow resources. So on the left, shameless self-promotion, follow my podcast. New episodes coming out on Thursday, not directly related to AI, but we'll see. So you can follow me on Twitter, at Theo Jaffe. My Substack stack newsletters, theojaffe.com. And I have my Theo Jaffe podcast on all platforms, YouTube, Substack, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, wherever there's RSS. Um, you can use X, formerly known as Twitter. This is by far the most common website I use to learn about AI stuff and AI alignment. Some of my favorite accounts are Rune at TSZZL, 
the guy who I mentioned a couple slides ago, Eliezer Yudkowsky's Twitter account, if you want a more pessimistic Doomer perspective, um, ES Yudkowsky. And finally, for a much more optimistic perspective, um, at TR Taxes Tex. He's another one of my favorite accounts. And then there's the website that was founded. Uh, it was founded to be a forum for human rationality, but now it's mostly a forum for AI alignment. It was founded by Yudkowsky, and it's called Less Wrong. Lesswrong.com. You should check it out. But also, follow my podcast stuff and use Twitter. So are there any questions? Yes. What's your personal opinion? So you presented everything kind of like objectively. What do you think the future of AI is going to look like? My personal opinion is the same as everyone else's, which is I don't know. But if you think about it kind of probabilistically, as opposed to like this will happen or this won't happen, I think that it's definitely possible that AGI risk like will kill us. I think, for example, it's much more of a risk than climate change or pandemics or nuclear war or, or things that people conventionally consider to be risks. But I'm mostly optimistic. I would say there's like at least a 90% chance that it goes well. Because of what I mentioned before about AI being aligned by default and drawing on the human prior. Any other questions? What kind of a goal do you think AGI could have where it would like want to wipe humanity out if we're just like in the way? Well, that's a great question. And the answer is at least according to Yudkowsky and the people who are more worried about AGI risk and alignment, the answer is almost any goal that isn't fully aligned with humanity. Because even if you give an AI a seemingly innocuous goal, like calculate as many digits of pi as possible, because of instrumental convergence, it will want to gather more and more and more resources and compute in order to calculate as many digits of pi as possible. And it might, for example, turn the entire crust of the Earth into computronium that computes as much as possible and boils the uh, Earth's oceans away when they're used for like CPU cooling and kills humanity in the process. Kind of like the famous analogy that gets used is like if you're trying to build a highway and there's an anthill in the way, it's just too bad for the ants. Like you don't hate the ants, nor do you love the ants but they're taking up space that you could use for something else. I kind of feel like the capabilities of language models are a little like overstated. In that like, yeah, I've seen like, like a language model be able to like convince someone like on, on like Fiverr to like do a capture for them and be able to convince them they're human. They're like, oh, like I'm a human with a vision impairment, like do this capture for me. So I could see them like potentially like deceiving people to do things for them, but they still can't really do anything on their own. I guess not yet. Not yet, but we're actively working on giving AI models, large language models, agency in the real world. Isn't that so, like a terrible idea? Well, if the AI is aligned, then no. It's a good idea. If the AI is not aligned, then yes, it's a terrible idea. But then how do we know if the AI is aligned? We don't yet. That's why we're working on interpretability. But generally speaking, I think that given how weak, relatively, AI systems are now, they're useful enough to be economically productive, but they're still weak enough so that they can't destroy humanity. So I think AI agents now are probably fine. If we use language models to interpret other language models, can't they just deceive us? Um, in theory, yes. In practice, like, it's not like GPT-4 has goals um, to deceive us yet. Think of, it, think of it this way. Like, if you have one AI trying to align another AI, and it gives you some kind of, like, formal, verifiable proof for how to make the AI aligned that you can evaluate yourself, that's very different from if it gives you a giant list of like decimal numbers and says like prompt the AI with this, trust me bro. Like, <laughs> so 
one nice property of the universe is that verification is easier than generation. So we can verify AI alignment a lot easier than we can make AIs aligned from first principles, which is one of the reasons why interpretability and bootstrapped alignment like this might work. <clears throat> Nikhil, any questions? No. Uh, was that good? Okay. I mean, we, we've already talked about it. True. We talked about this a lot. Mostly AI, <laughs> but I've talked about a lot of different things with a lot of different people. I've had five episodes so far. Sixth one comes out um, this week. Um, the first episode was with a software engineer named Greg Fodor. We talked about AI, but we also talked about AR and VR. Um, we talked about, um, yeah, mostly AI, AR, and VR. But there's a lot to talk about within those fields. Um, I've talked to, my most recent episode was with Quentin Pope, who's a technical alignment researcher, who's like unique among technical alignment researchers in that he's super optimistic about the prospects of AI going well. Um, and yeah, this, this week's episode is not directly related to AI. Um, it will be more about like genetics. Um, it's with a dude named Razib Khan. You heard it here first. Spoilers for the next episode of the Jaffe podcast. But yeah, definitely check it out. Any other questions? Thanks for having me. It's very cool. Yeah. All right, so uh, I guess this concludes the presentation. I had a lot of fun. Thank you all for being here. Well, yes, but also, like, this has been the most interesting year for AI ever. So, right. I'm like, I'm Brian. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, nice to meet you. Me too. Um, I'm actually like just like starting to like transition into machine learning. Nice. Um, I've just been like a software engineer 